All right, everyone. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Aware Athlete Show. I'm your host, Scott Forrester, and today we have as our guest, Violet Van Hees, my Hi. friend and fellow Feldenkrais practitioner and adventurer. And today we will be talking about stress, the good and the bad of stress and how it affects you. And I think uh, Violet has some things she want to in, wants to introduce to us as soon as we say, welcome to the show, Violet. Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It's yeah. lovely to be here. I'm glad to have you. Yeah. So. And I love, I love the topic of um, stress and physiology and those things, because there's so much that affects us in our biology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's sort of the mental training aspect, but our body has a lot to say about what's going on, mm -hmm. right? And if our body is not in agreement with what we're trying to do, we run into trouble. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that um, confuses people because we're taught, you know, we can think our way through things. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah. if, if the physiology is kind of going, I don't like what we're doing, right? Or I don't believe what's going on here, then we're going to run into trouble because the body will take over basically and we'll run things yeah absolutely because a lot of our life is unconscious yeah unconscious yeah. processes um, plus the yeah. biology you know our biology was around for a long time before our little thinking brain came along in, in terms of evolution and our mm -hmm. and our biology our physiology that whole evolutionary development kept us alive yeah and i've really forgotten about the fact that it kept us alive and it you know like our body helped us survive and survival takes over if there's ever a sense of fear or worry in the body. Yeah. And then, then whatever the thinking brain might think, the body's going, that's nice, but we got to stay alive, right? Yeah, it's absolutely so. That. Absolutely. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, Moshe Feldman Christ used to say that, uh, well, when, when he began to teach self-defense in Israel, I understand that he would teach people to use their instinctive reaction to an attack yeah. as their first move. And yeah. he would say, you know, all this martial arts training, that's great. If you practice that every single day of your life, then no one can attack you. But, but if, if you don't bring it in to that kind of a state, you know, where you're constantly practicing, constantly making this part of your life, then you just revert to a, some kind of a survival instinct. Yeah. Well, and even if you do practice a lot, right? It's sort of like the first, the initial response is, is he always said, use the initial response. Use that to, to yeah. start your movement rather right. than assuming that you have to do something different. Just use that to your advantage. Work yeah. with your physiology, work with your body so you can really get the most out of what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. So he actually uh, built that into yeah. uh, any training that he did with people yeah. in that area. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, all the physiology stuff here, I figure if we can work with our smart bodies, then things make a lot more sense and things work out a lot better in physical training, in athletic stuff and all that, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have a, you know, you and I have both been athletes you know, for a long time. I've been more of a, you know, a recreational athlete all my life, but I've been, I was a fitness instructor for 30 years. I taught fitness instructors to become fitness instructors. I, you know, was involved with stuff from the teenage years on in in terms of physiology and development and what we're doing and what works and what doesn't and figuring these things out and it's gradually putting pieces together and having to rethink stuff that I thought was one way and figuring out actually that doesn't seem to be working when I try something new something else happens right so then what yeah. what does this mean how does it come together so that's my background and that's that's sort of um you know, I'm interested in helping people learn new stuff and right. have fun in life until they're 105. Exactly. No, that's uh, that's actually the emphasis of the aware athlete. It's not yeah. it's not only athletes, but in, in life, life is an endurance sport. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. And yeah, life is an endurance sport. <laughs> yeah. We want to make sure that we cross that finish line well used up, thoroughly, you know, really done a great job but we don't want to we want to make sure that we still have oomph to do the stuff that's fun that's right yeah and that's that's, that's, that's what it's all about what interests me yeah yeah so do you have a little little bit of a review or a presentation yeah for us? what i was going to do is just do a quick 
review. I did a presentation. It was two and a half years ago. I can't believe that. That we, exactly. we talked in 2019. Um, and I did a slide uh, a presentation for you on fight, flight, and freeze and the physiology of those and what happens in the body around those. That is too, hard to believe that was two and a half years ago. Yeah. I know. I know. Um, but I'd like to do sort of a, a review of like about three slides in that, because then we can use that mm -hmm. to talk now about the stuff we want to talk about today. And I'll bring in more examples from animals because animals are such a good reflection. If we're not sure what it is when we're talking about, you know, my, you know, talking to my biology or talking to my whatever, it's like imagining an animal response, you know, because we don't have the extra layers complicating things. Um, the brain sometimes complicates things and, and the body's actually pretty clear a lot. And if we think about animals, that helps us. But we'll first look at these other slides and then we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. And I'll bring right. in animal examples and stuff. All right. Yeah. I remember you opened last uh, the last presentation with an Arabian horse. Right. Yes. So let's see if I can find that presentation. Here you go. There. That one. Okay, can you see that? I can see the uh, main slide just really well. Okay, so I'm gonna keep it on, not, not, I'm not gonna put it on slideshow because I just wanna be able to flip from slide to slide. But I think, oops, the Arabian horse that you saw is that one probably, right? That's the one. That's the one. Yeah, and just as an introduction to me, I like, you know, a bit of information here. I, I am a Feldenkrais practitioner. I was a teacher, I worked in government doing policy work for a long time, but I've been mostly for what matters here is a lifelong person interested in how do you have fun in life? How do you do the things you want to do and do them well and uh, learn to do them well easily, right? Right. So that we can do things and feel at ease while we're doing them. And so that's been a real big interest for me. And one of the things that I got into with that was really looking at the physiology and looking at the polyvagal theory was one of the things that came up, you know, the work that Stephen Porges did where he's looking at, you know, we, we're either in a state of wellness where everything is well and everything's going well, or we're in a state of response to danger. And our physiology is very different in those two states. And the response to danger, we fire up all the stress chemistry, our uh, nervous system goes into a different track, our uh, rest and recovery kinds of things like digestion and immune systems and uh, hormonal balance and so on. That stuff sort of goes on the wayside and we just do stuff that we need to, to stay alive and deal with the immediate situation. And we've you know, we always thought of our responses as being either sympathetic arousal, the sympathetic nervous system fires you up for action, or um, a, uh, calming down, a parasympathetic. But Stephen Porges, Dr. Stephen Porges said that actually it works, the, the, the slowing down has two circuits. One of them that takes you into sort of the calm, relaxed recovery state but if you land on the other side, instead, you can land in a, uh, what's called freeze in the physiology, where you get a dampening down or a numbing of sensation. Um, it's also a quieter state, but it's a stress chemistry state. Yeah, could, couldn't you call that uh, fear? <laughs> well, yeah, it's a fear, but the fear can, can result in either action for arousal mm -hmm. or it can result. So if it's in the sympathetic nervous system and you're firing up for action, um, fear can fire you up for action. Yeah. Fear can also be so great that the basic response is to, you can't get away, you can't run away, you can't do anything, you're going to just go numb. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that in life, there's a lot of things that take us, it's sort of like falling off the bridge, you're going off the bridge, right? You go from arousal, you, can, you go up, mm -hmm. and then you can either land, come down, and go into all's well on one side of the bridge, or you land in a completely different country over here when you go into a danger response. And the danger response can be anything. It can just be, you know, that you're overwhelmed. And so, but you have to keep going. Um, you know, you got a family, you got kids, you got a job, you got whatever. And so you just put a lid on everything and keep going. But it's not in a recovery state. You're still running on stress chemistry on the inside. And that's the big difference here. 
And for athletes, if you want to recover, this is not the side that you recover on because this has got all sorts of adrenaline running in it. If you're there in the long term, you're running on cortisol and cortisol is a catabolic hormone. So it breaks down the body um, rather than anabolic where you're building up the body. Um, so you're breaking down here. You're basically running yourself into the ground if you're staying over on this side. Mm -hmm. And even if you're calm, you know, you might be over on this side and be very calm, but you're numb. And your body is still in stress chemistry and not recovering. So that's where burnout can happen. And people get confused because they'll say, well, I, you know, I, I rested. I did stuff, but it doesn't feel like rest inside the physiology. Whereas on this side over here, the all is well state, this is, you know, where they talk about um, animals go back to grazing, you go back, you can sleep, you can, you can enjoy yourself, you can do all those things over here. And it has a whole different feel because your physiology is not running on that stress chemistry. It's different chemistry. So basically, this is the one I really wanted to show. So there, and there is a range that we tend to, that we can be within in our nervous system, a range of up and down where everything feels good. So where you feel safe, where you don't feel like you're in danger, you don't feel like your, your survival is at stake, you don't feel stressed or overwhelmed or any of those kinds of things, right? And there can be, and so you can get arousal, you can go for a run and you can sort of rev up and go for your run and it feels good. You can have play fights. You can be intimate with someone. You can um, do the fun stuff in life that, you know, get excited for coming to talk to Scott Forrester on a podcast, right? <laughs> Those things. That can be sort of an up and then you rest after that. You have lunch, you have a rest, you sleep at night and you actually get restful sleep. You do all those things where there is recovery and this, there's this range um, that can be called like a window of tolerance in our body where it feels good and life works well when you're in there. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you end up outside of that range for too long. So um, this is, these are my slides from two and a half years ago. So anyone that wants to see the whole presentation can go back and have another look at that or they can let me know and I can send them. Yeah. Basically, what happens when things get scary or overwhelming or too much, or you just have to keep going? You got to get it done and you just got to keep going, right? Mm -hmm. Or you go for a hard run. If you go for a hard run and you're running a hard race, you might go out of this range for a little while. But then if you come back into the range again, you can recover. However, if you end up dropping too far into freeze, um, you, or freeze can also be really useful is what I mean. Freeze can be a really useful thing to have happen. Like if I'm a first aid attendant and I have to, I have to deal or you're in a first aid situation and you come into the situation and you have to act, but you can't feel too much, right? Because there's a lot of stuff there. You don't want to be really emotionally caught in it. So you kind of put a lid on it. You make, you numb yourself out. You do what you have to do. And then hopefully afterwards you can debrief and it can kind of move through. If, however, you get stuck, either in too much arousal up here or too much numbing out for too long, then you get stuck in that stress physiology. And that's where the real burnout and the wearing out of the body happens. And so that's, you know, in the, in the last talk I talked about, you got to sort of watch yourself and find out, are you, are you getting up into these places? Or do you go down there and the only way out of here is to throw yourself up? So real adrenal, adrenaline junkie people, people who just need more and more risk, more and more extremeness in something in order to feel something. They tend to be outside of this, the, this range in here and they tend to be moving from here to there, to there, to there, right? It's sort of like to feel anything, they have to push harder and harder and harder because they spend most of their time stuck down here and then to kick it out. So that's a PTSD, people coming back from the war as well. When they, and they, a normal daily life, they just can't relate to it anymore. It, it's too, they're, they're just so shocked in their system that they have to go into extremes to feel anything. 
those are indications that you got to figure out how to get your nervous system back into being able to feel a normal range or be in a normal range so that you can actually recover and you can actually have quality um, experiences and, and, and enjoy things differently, right? Right. So this, uh, this could be a daily cycle of uh, activity and recovery, or it could yeah. be a weekly cycle or even longer. Yeah. And still, and still be planned. You used a couple of terms there, one sensing and one numb. Yeah. Numbing. And uh, those are very interesting terms, actually. You could probably have a whole discussion for an hour on what numbing means. <laughs> well, yeah. Nothing. And so here's the biology. We can talk about the biology, right? Let's see if I have any good photos of this. So if you can imagine being a trail riding horse, you know, one of the horses that's in the strings are those long trail rides that go out in the Rocky Mountains and they get somebody else on like six times a day, they go out or four times a day, they go out and they get riders who know nothing about what they're doing. And they just have to do their job and not actually notice their rider. <laughs> they just work best if they don't really notice what the person is doing on their back. So they kind of go numb. They kind of shut down their eyes, kind of glaze over. They kind of do this, you know, they kind yeah. of walk along. They're not really noticing a lot around them. And that's a coping mechanism, you know, and they will go into that during the ride. Later on, when they're out with the horses, they might be a normal horse and kind of respond normally to the world. But when they're doing their job, they might numb themselves out. Now, there's a lot of humans who probably do the same thing. Kind of going through the motions, doing what they got to do to get through what they're doing, either their work or some situation they're in, or just life in general, you know? So that's kind of the numbing out. There's the extreme numbing out where you go, you know, where the gazelle gets carried away by a lion, but, and looks like it's dead, but it's not, right? And it can jump up and run away um, later on when there's a moment for that. And that's, that's also a, a numbing, and that's an extreme form of it, but there's lighter forms that I call functional freeze, where you're sort of functioning, and you might be very high functioning, but you're not feeling a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So should, so, I come out of, should I come out of these slides and then we'll just chat? Sure. Or do, okay, then we can always come back if we want to. Huh. Where is it? How do I stop sharing? There. Okay, All right. I'm back. You are. So, um, what? Let's uh, let's talk about some examples of bad stress, of o overload. Uh, what can you think of that are examples of that? Of overload? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about overtraining. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's talk athletic stuff here. So overtraining when people burn out from training too much. That's gonna be because your body is not actually resting. You're not actually recovering in between workouts. Right. In between runs, right? Right, right. Yeah, so that's right. one. So, so your performance actually uh, decreases rather than improved. Yeah, so what happens is, is all your normal hormonal levels, your, your good kind of hormones that help you uh, do anabolic improvement in between workouts. The ideal is in a workout, you'll do some catabolic stress in the body where you work a little harder than, than what uh, you normally might. So you push the body a bit and then the body goes, oh, I better sort of beef up a little bit here or sort of get the aerobic system up a little stronger so I can respond better, right? That's sort of right. right. And then if you rest, that actually happens. Right. But if you don't actually That's get a chance to rest, your body just kind of goes, I really should do that, you know? really would be good to do that when I get to the place where I'm resting. But in the background, there's this buzz. So uh, you overtrain partly because you're really not aware of what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Or, you yeah push, so. or, you, or your environment doesn't allow it. There's a lot of high performance athletes that get, um, that get, you know, like irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, uh, they can't digest food well, their whole system becomes kind of a bit of a train wreck, right? Yeah. But they're pushing to train and they're, they're being, they, they feel they need to this way. And it's the psychological stress in, in, in addition to the physiological stress 
will add to this. And there's books that have been written about, you know, what happens when the body goes too long. You know, Gabor Mate wrote uh, When the Body Says No. And yeah. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk wrote um, uh, The Body. I can get the books later. I've got a minute. I'll just run and get there's three of them that I yeah. use. And there's, you know, the, the polyvagal theory talks about what's going on if you don't get a chance to actually rest in the good rest. Right. Oh, the body, the body uh, keeps the score is, is Bessel van der Kolk's book, right? So uh, you say the environment doesn't let them. So actually, I think uh, one major factor in, uh, well, it is just an aspect of what you're talking about, the major factor is uh, overload is caused by not being in touch with the body. In other words, yeah. it's, it's uh, caused by could be caused at work. That's one of the major causes. Uh, external expectations, whether you accept them or whether there's placed on you and you kind of try to meet them. Uh, unrealistic goals and uh, uh, things things that you try to do that you can't do that you never had a chance to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you just keep you keep pushing for the impossible. And you know, we're lot. driving with willpower, you know, willpower you is one of the, you're pushing yourself to go do stuff continuously instead of allowing yourself to come into a place where you can be pulled into it, kind of like it's, it's easy to move into it, right? You keep pushing yourself into that stuff. That's, that's, that's usually an indicator that something is getting worn out, that probably there's, there's a, a wearing out that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of times that's caused by external circumstances. You can think of being at work. You could think of being in a prison camp yeah. where you're pretty much going to do what you're told yeah. unless you want to die. Yeah. And, uh, and it could be that you started this, you know, like, like a lot of people when, when in, I've also worked with looking at how trauma sits in the body, you know, and, and for a lot of people, we grew up in families who were pretty wired. The whole family system didn't actually sit in that middle range that was good. They kind of ran at a high wired energy, right? Yeah. If you're born into that, your little physiology is kind of going to go, I'm totally reliant on everybody here. I'm dependent on this. I better match it. Yeah. Okay? So you learn to match that and then your survival, your body recognizes that's where I have to be to survive. So it does that. Yeah. even though it's not a recovery state. And so actually finding safety or noticing in your body what safety feels like or what feels good is a really foreign, weird thing to do. So it's I just want to mention is. this to people who are, who are out there who kind of go, like, this feels normal. Or whenever somebody, you know, they've been in a yoga class and yoga gets to the last move and everybody gets to lay on the ground and just relax and have a good time and everybody else looks like they're having a great time and you're laying there going... I think I want to explode, but I'm just going to lay here because I don't want to look like an idiot, right? Yeah, yeah. But your whole, that's your body telling you that it doesn't actually feel safe in this moment to go into a slowed down state or it doesn't know how, one or the other. Yeah, but that's that, your body and, talking to you. Like I say, that can start with uh, childhood experiences. Absolutely. And it, and it does because there you're under authority. And yeah. then that carries over into culture you know, our, our general cultural expectations, they say, and of course, we're used to this, right? I'm used to being an American. <laughs> but they say that uh, Americans uh, work harder than anybody else in the world. Uh, more hours or more, you know, I don't know. That's what they say. I haven't lived anywhere else. But I do know there's a lot of things imposed on you at work. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I hear uh, stories of people bringing lawsuits uh, about uh, companies not allowing you to take a break or even it's hard to find time to go to the bathroom. And I thought, oh, that's your lawsuit? That's the way it is everywhere all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, I think there can be lots of different things, right? We also impose it on ourselves. Right. But, you know, I grew up in an ethic where if it wasn't hard, it wasn't worth doing. Right. Right. And so that becomes sort of a belief system in the back of your mind. And right. Right. And so that's where you know, working smarter, not harder. It's a nice idea what your body's going No, That's not right. I should be working harder because otherwise it's not worthwhile. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So rather than learn uh, anything that makes push-ups easier, 
there are some people that think that if if you're taking the easy way out, you're not doing the right thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, a, that's a, one of the funny things with Feldenkrais, right? Because when you actually find that the easy way for your body to do stuff, first of all, you'd hardly notice it because it's easy. And then you're kind of going, well, it should feel hard. You know, yeah. if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's like a, a performance thing, it should feel, <laughs> so learning to run easy or do a push up that feels easy or a sit up that feels easy. Like that just, it's like, what? Yeah, that's, that's a major challenge to our culture and to ourselves <laughs> yeah. and to our self-image. And, uh, and it hit me hard when it happened. <laughs> yeah, it really did. It really changed things. But I, I wanted the change because I wanted to continue to do what I like to do. <laughs> so when you say that it hits you hard, tell me more. What, just, what do you mean by that? Well, see, uh, I would still like to do some of these things, but uh, part of it's just being young. But as a young person, I, I still kind of liked, you know, this kind of thing. But as a young person, I would, uh, I remember I was working with another young guy in construction and we would carry floor joists. Well, they're all piled up in one spot. So like I'd carry four of them to the back of the house and then he'd carry five and then I'd carry six right. and he'd carry seven and I'd carry eight, you know, and then we'd be done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it was friendly. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, Boy, I'm gonna beat him. It was, yeah, it was just the way. Well, yeah, and there's, there's the competition aspect of that, right? But it's it's actually really satisfying to feel strong. Yeah, right. But, but it carried over into the bull in the china shop, impulsive action, mm. you know, type of type of thing. So yeah, uh, so, you know, I still like to carry heavy weights. Yeah, but so do I. yeah, but. Uh, but giving up the idea that you have to do everything uh, out of strength. Yeah, or, or notice, for me, it's noticing strength in a different way, right? So I can still lift a canoe on my, from myself. I can lift my solo canoe from the ground overhead, put it on my car Yeah. Um, and stuff like that. And I feel, I'm happy that I can do that. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's very and important. I've learned, to, I've learned to do it in a way where it's not, it's not hard. It's, it's technically, it takes some skill to get it. But if the work transfers through the bones and gets into the ground, I don't have to have big beefy biceps to do these things. Right? Yeah, you've got your whole body to lift it. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's really satisfying to feel strong. Um, and it's actually becoming really interesting to feel strong in ways that are really efficient because I can do stuff that other people can't and I don't feel overwhelmed by the work, right? And so that's how I'm shifting, you know, for people who are like, you know, who are, who are like us, it has to be hard. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is shifting around now, but I can figure out how can I still do this as I'm turning into an older dame along with my horse, my, my old horse and I go off and do old dame things together. But, yeah. um, you know, but still do the things I'm learning to surf. I have to learn how to serve differently than I would have learned to serve 30 years ago because I have to be much smarter about it now and figure out how do I do this so it actually feels easy. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, even uh, we were talking about martial arts earlier. Uh, it's good to learn martial arts and some people will learn them so much so that they that becomes a part of them. Yeah. For sure. And so that they would uh, they would tend to have a better response to a confrontation than someone has no idea what to do. You know, that just screams and throws up their hands or something. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so all that training is not in vain. Uh, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you the can- more variety, I, I find the more variety we have in learning how to respond to the world, the safer we feel too, because then we, we can respond in whatever way is called for in a particular right. situation. Yeah. Right, and that's very much so with martial arts, which was a big part of Moshe's uh, yeah. lessons, that all those thousand lessons that yeah. he developed. Uh, he learned a lot from them, and he learned a lot about leverages and making things easier and responding faster and having different options. And he, so it's a, it's a big thing going along with that martial arts and learning skills and learning skills to lift the, uh, the canoe or the kayak or whatever it is you're lifting. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a big thing. He would, he would always say that uh, it's sufficient to use willpower. Use your will to develop more skill. 
Yeah, and, and, and uh, that's that's one of the things he also talked about. You know, if it doesn't feel safe, your body won't do silly things. Yeah. You know, you have to feel safe first, and using will sometimes uh, pushes you into doing stuff, even though your body is saying no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if it's purely for survival, you might have to do it anyways. But if it's for stuff yeah. that we're yeah. wanting, like sports development, right? If we want to have improvement over time. We really need to look at that. Yeah, and that's an extremely important point. And I really wanted to get around to that. And you, and you just did because will is not a bad thing. It's a good thing that we have, we can will to do something sometimes. Yes. And like you say, in a survival situation or in a situation where we kind of want to do something, we have a conflict, but we really know we shouldn't do it. And that's the only response we have. You got to use your willpower. Yeah. If you're going to run away from something, run right yeah you have to sort of use or you gotta you gotta fight something you might need to use will to 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 do yeah. it and then yeah. deal with it and then move on yeah you might even have to use will to uh, to resist your own impulse to do something yeah uh and that will not be a permanent solution yeah but if it helps in the moment to survive or or to do the right thing use your will yeah, the trick is that you don't want to stay in that and have that be how you always respond. So right, uh, right. in our society, you know, as a fitness instructor, there would be people who would go to fitness classes five, six, seven days a week, right? Or go for runs this often. Mm -hmm. And they would push themselves to go because, you know, this is what you have to do. It's sort of like an addiction that you have to do this. It's something to do with self-image or with whatever you, whatever drives you. But there's, there's something where you're pushing yourself. And then if the body wasn't willing, people now resort to energy drinks or oh, yeah. you know, yeah. Coca-Cola, you know, like caffe caffeinated stuff, that kind of stuff, which is a substitute for the adrenaline. <laughs> Basically, if your adrenaline has gone yeah, and there isn't much left of that in your body, you should be paying attention to that and kind of going, oh, I'm out of juice. I'm running yeah, out of juice. That's you know? right. And if, if it's really important in the moment, uh, with the right mental attitude, you can manufacture a little bit of energy. Yeah, and you can do it for an action in the moment. Just yeah. make sure that you actually get to recover afterwards. That's right, that's right. You know, and so uh, like I've, I've been in that running on fumes place. This is not mm -hmm. a good place to be. And this is where real severe illness can really come in. Yeah. Where your body is going to break down, where things are going to go sideways inside systemic, physiology systems, right? This is not a surprise when this happens in life. It's often when things are getting pretty run down on a consistent basis. And yeah. there hasn't been time to recover. Right. Yeah. That can happen with sleep, sleep and work, sleep and athletes. It's yeah. been proven that, uh, or proven. Uh, studies have shown, I, I remember one with basketball players that they had uh, took a group of athletes and made sure they got less than seven hours a night's sleep. And, you know, when, when you're performing in a, at a high level at, in an athletic competition like basketball or something, and uh, you're going to practice every day and you're playing these high pressure games, yep. you could use a little sleep for sure. And yeah. then they had another group that was getting at least nine hours sleep. So less than seven and at least nine. And obviously the other group the high sleep group got had much better performance yeah and measured it and you know in, in practice and then in, in how they did in games and so yeah that's that's one yeah and, and then here's another thing that uh we have so much to do people get in a hurry they're forced to do certain schedules over a lifetime where they don't eat very well you don't have time to eat lunch your blood sugar gets real low and you do that for 10 20 30 years or you only have time for a really quick meal. It's not, you know, just those yeah, times yeah. that things are very deleterious over a long time, I think. Yeah, and, and that stuff really sort of undermines, I think um, all the things around us, all those kinds of things feed into what happens then inside the body, when the body, so being able to chat with your body and kind of figure out, okay, how are we, <laughs> right? And checking in, how am I doing? And, and a lot of people have no idea how to check in with their body because that's sort of like just a foreign thing. So the brain goes, I'm fine. 
everything's fine. I had breakfast. I had, you know, I was in bed for eight hours. Did you sleep well? No, but I was in bed for eight hours, you know, like it's, it's, it's sort of like not paying attention to what's going on here. So I invite people to kind of imagine having a conversation, I actually have a conversation with, you know, the gut. And then there's a big vagal, the, the, one of the vagal nerve complexes is here. One is in the gut. Um, there's, a, there's an area in the back of the, 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 the base of the, the, um, the brain stem here. You can talk to these places in your body and just sort of ask, how are things, what do you think? You know, ask yourself, what do I think in all these different places? Because my brain might be thinking one thing, but the body believes what the body experiences. So, and the body's had enough experience with the, you know, smart ideas from the brain that weren't so smart in the long term to kind of go, you know what? I don't care what I think. I care what I feel, what I, what I actually experience. So this is where when we want to switch something, if we want to switch and learn something new or learn how to talk with the body or learn how to pay attention to this, we need to give ourselves a bit of time and a bit of place to notice our experience. To first of all, ask, you know, and I've had people that say to me when I've, when I've, you know, I say, have a chat with your body, blah, 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 blah. And a week or two later, they come back to me and they say, you know what? My body actually talks back. And I said, what does it say? It says, yeah. how polite of you to ask. Thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, boy, that's exactly right. Because right? we just, we, who's ever taught to do that? Yeah. Generally. And you might not yeah. like what, what comes back, right? Because the body might be saying, no, don't do that, right? The brain says, I think we ought to go do this. And the body's going, uh-uh. Yeah. Or I think this is a great idea. And the body's just glaring at you, you know? And it's sort of like, are you nuts? Yeah. Yeah. So you, oh. then, you, then you realize that you need more time to spend looking at your own self to figure out, you know, what's a good thing for me to do? Because if all of, all of yourself can say yes, your performance is going to be better. Your capacity to respond is going to be better. Your, and you're just going to do better at what you're planning to do there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's look at this in terms of uh, training. Let's say you want to do something and, uh, and your, body, your body sends you signals. Well, let's, yeah. let's, let's look at the extra. Let's go, go uh, and continue with what we're talking about first. But uh, external pressure. So it, not too long ago, and there's, this is always coming up, but not too long ago, there was a big scandal in uh, athletics. It's particularly in track. I won't go into it. And uh, somebody had the courage to stand up to what was being required of them. And then some others did, uh, you know, following the example. So there's a certain element of uh, uh, courage in, uh, in, in actually listening to your body or actually yeah. doing, doing the right thing in terms of external pressure, which can come from the external environment, coaches, for sure. And uh, you know, I can think of more than one sport where wrong external pressures have been been applied to athletes it's 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 all over the place any any high level sport will have that yeah you're being driven to perform at maximum level and especially if you're on More a team. Than what your body would choose right especially if you're on a team and other people are involved it really takes a lot of a lot of courage and especially if and this is the way most of our cultural systems are uh the unspoken threat is if you if you if you resist this, you could resist it more than one way. You could go public about it, or you could just not do what the coach wants. But if you resist this, you'll never get to do this again. Yeah. Or you'll, or you'll, you'll really be set back in your. You're out. You're, you're either with us or you're out. One or the other. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. and that's the way it is. So yeah. there's an element of courage, and it reminds me of the story of Moshe eating bacon. Do you remember that? No, I don't. Oh, you don't. No. Well, uh, he was determined to put aside all the cultural bias that was placed on him <laughs> as a Jew. Oh my goodness. Okay. 
And so he, he ate bacon and I've heard a couple of different accounts. I read his biography and, and somebody else talked about it, but uh, he ate bacon and then he had the urge to throw it up because it's so against his culture. Yeah. And he shouldn't do that. And all this is ingrained in him. Yeah. And so he said, if you do not eat this bacon, you will never be able to make another free choice in your life. So he got some more. He ate now another one person said a homeopathic dose, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. And go ahead. Yeah, I think I think it's really interesting to look at to, to allow ourselves to look at what constrains us or what drives us. Yeah. You know, what is driving, and it can be my own judgment of myself that can drive me. It can be external judgment of me that can drive me. It can be a lot of different places, but it's becoming familiar with that and deciding, will I let that drive me? If you're able to, if you're in a situation where you can do that, it's very difficult in some situations to do that, right? But if we have the choice, what do you choose to do? Yeah. And at different times in our life, we might choose different things. But the cost, there's a big cost. So back to the physiology. If we keep doing stuff that wears us down or that goes against what our body says, there's a cost. Yeah. And that cost is going to be eroding health over time. And so those books that I talked about, you know, the body keeps the score. Um, and when the body says no, there's a bunch of other ones. Talk about the types of costs that have yeah. been seen in medical science around not listening or continuing to run in that stress physiology. It's interesting because there are costs either way. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if you stand up to the system, there's a cost. Yeah. If you don't stand up to the system, there's a terrible cost. Yeah. And so which cost do you want? <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. It's a big, it's a big thing. And it's, um, and just know that there is a cost to the physiology, right? Right. And, and take that into account as you're weighing the different things. So there's a number, I know a couple of people um, who were in really high performance sports, mm -hmm. you know, cross country ski teams, those kinds of things, who just decided the cost was too great. They would let it go. They would do something else. Yeah. There's also a matter of uh, prioritizing. What would you say about that? In other words, uh, uh, not prioritizing and trying to do everything in the world can cause a lot of stress. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you might be able to do exactly what you wanted to do if you don't do a few other things at the time. Yeah, and it's, it's sort of like not being super mom or super dad or super whoever. Mm -hmm. um, and also having the experience that if you take some time off, so this is for people who, who are sort of managing their own, their own, like if you're a runner who's managing your own running schedule or, or whatever, you end up having some time off. Maybe you had an injury or something and you come back and you're better. You actually perform better when you come back. It's paying attention to that and going, hmm, that's weird. That's not yeah. what I expected because I was working out every single day or you know, seven, six times a week because I thought that was the way to get better, faster. Yeah. Yeah. And it's in part finding out maybe that's where the whole thing works smarter, not harder came from, right? It's like, maybe <laughs> there are some smarter ways to do this. Yeah. And, there's, and, and, and one of the things that Feldenkrais work, works with and that um, actually a lot of athletes do work with, but I want to talk about it, is working with intention and working with imagination. Oh, yes. Right? Because I yeah. wanted to come into this because there's ways to practice stuff or to look at stuff and to try things out that don't tax your body, but that give your body a visceral experience uh, as if it's experiencing the real thing. So one of those things is imagining doing activity, but in your muscle imagination, in sensory imagination. So it's not like visualizing and sort of from here up imagining, so skiers, if a skier is gonna go do downhill run and they're imagining the slalom course, they're gonna be going down. Yeah. You can see them when they're standing there and they're kind of doing little mini moves and they're kind of leaning and doing this and doing that. Their whole body is feeling that course and preparing for that course. And it's in the physiology and it feels like 
real experience in your body. Yeah. And in our building Christ lessons, we'll do that. We'll sometimes do a movement on one side of the body. You know, so we might, for example, like if we're um, practicing just looking over one shoulder, right? We might look over the shoulder in different ways. We might have done a little, we can do this later if we want to, you know, Let's see how far you can go this side, that side. And then you're just kind of doing a few little moves, move the head, move the head and shoulders, keep the shoulders forward, move the eyes forward. And then you find out how can you move? Is it different? And then you imagine doing the same thing to the other side. And the thing is with the imaginations, you can iron out all the wrinkles. Yeah. So you can make it super smooth and super good and all those things. And then you try it and you find out, oh, my body learned something by imagining. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you, you can never talk too much about the imagination or even the power of the mind at all, I don't think. Well, I think I, it's, it's not just the power of the mind. And that's I think that's the mindfulness part is mindfulness without the body connected to it is very different than whole body awareness and that's yeah. i think that the, the beauty of the word awareness or whatever it's but it's, it's bringing it not sort of into this kind of awareness it's into this whole body self whole self-awareness all the muscles all the senses all those things being part of it because then all of yourself gets to be part of that experience and gets to create a new experience because you're I, uh, yeah I, I just talked to a hypnotherapist and when you know I'm, the word trance uh, I think is just misunderstood in our culture but uh, we're we're all in a trance all the time usually <laughs> in one way or another it's what you focus on and uh, as he actually did a little bit with me uh, he uh, he brought in the whole experience uh, you know, he didn't just say think of something, but he actually had you sitting on a park bench or out, out yeah. outside or yeah, that yeah. type of thing. So imagine this now. You're going to go through all the movements of going down this particular slalom course, which I know nothing about because I've never skied. But uh, so I couldn't imagine it very well, not like like a skier could. Well, you but could imagine uh, smooth, easy running. I could. Yeah. yeah. But I couldn't imagine it perfectly because I've never done it perfectly. No, but yeah. you could imagine what process. Really good. You could imagine yourself running in a way that really feels good. And you might be imagining it after you've been watching a horse run. And the horse has a particular kind of real fluid movement, right? Yeah. And there's something about seeing that that your body goes, ooh, that looks good. And we're built to be able to take stuff in in our physiology so this is again our smart body that's way way smarter than the little brain that's trying to you know this that this that this is like the whole body kind of going ooh, smooth running yeah yeah no you've got a picture of it and i think uh uh endurance trail runners uh i don't know about everybody but probably but you like to think of yourself as uh as free as an animal that's out yes. there there are some endurance animals and some animals that are not so much yeah in terms of the miles they cover, but a dog, of course, might be one of them. Yeah, they can and trot. A, a horse can a trot horse. for a hundred miles. You know those kinds of things. Like, yeah, and, it, yeah, and being yeah. able to bring that that kind of imagination into you as the quality of the movement, then your body oh, yeah. does something with it. You don't have yeah. to think it. Your body does something. We have mirror neurons inside our body. We have physiology in us that's that's built to mimic the quality of something so that we can see what it's like. Right. So you've already uh, brought up uh, the point that I was trying to get at, which is <laughs> the emotional state of uh, imagining. For instance, I could imagine myself going down this slalom course and uh, I get down to the bottom and I've imagined every, every pin on the course. But what if I did it? What if I imagine enjoying every turn? Exactly. And I was yeah. just in control of the experience. And then I could even imagine a mistake and still enjoying it. Yes. And getting up, you know, you can all, so the emotional state, very powerful. It's really powerful. And the emotional state has a lot to do with whether the physiology feels like it's a danger or something that's just a nice thrill, a fun thrill. Mm -hmm. there's, there's sometimes a very thin line be between fun excitement and, oh my God, that, 
this is now this is scary yeah right and being able to stay in that place is then you're in the physiology that supports like learning the other thing about being on the side that um is the all is well side is that's where real learning can happen new stuff can be happening there right the other side the survival side is mostly interested in what kept me alive before and can yeah. i use it again right now yeah, same it's, thing you do the same it's interested thing. in uh, i don't have any time i better respond yeah yeah it's so like la 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 right i'm just yeah. gonna deal with life but if we want to learn something new we can learn best learn easiest we can explore that other way of running we can imagine what it's like to run like a wild animal or to to i can imagine learning on my paddleboard to be able to surf down a wave and carve this way and then actually turn and carve this way i can imagine those things mm -hmm. and imagine doing those things if it feels safe and if it feels kind of interesting then my body's kind of going Ooh, that's interesting yeah whereas if I, all i think about is you know i'm gonna get smacked by that wave and it's gonna hurt it's like why would i be interested in that <laughs> yeah i don't i i don't think that's exactly uh, what people think when they're doing that no, but they might. But, you know, they, they, often I mean, it's a it's a double edged thing, right? It is. It is a double edged thing. Uh, I think it's. Uh, do you remember the person who first uh, free climbed uh, El Capitan, two or three thousand feet of granite straight up? I think it's Alex. Do you remember the name? I don't Arnold? remember it. No. On hold, I think. Yeah. And anyway, he's he described that, and he had every he's climbed it before with ropes. Every single inch of that thing was memorized yeah wow and uh every movement i mean you can't make a mistake because you're going to yeah. fall three thousand feet yeah and you, you'd think he was crazy but he wasn't because he was so much in what he was doing at the moment yeah that if something didn't feel right he just wouldn't do it it's not it's yeah. not my day not doing it yeah you get you could get halfway up and you know not doing it yeah, not doing the next one until I wait. Yeah, until, I, until I've got that, that feeling and I know what needs to come next. Yeah. 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 So that it's pretty amazing. Uh, years ago, I had somebody tell me, oh, football, that's just a game played on pure emotion and hype. And that you couldn't be more wrong. You just couldn't. If you played only on pure emotion and hype, you'll just, I mean, you don't know what you're doing. And it's such, it is such a game of timing and knowing where you're supposed to be. Yeah. If you don't know where you're supposed to be to the inch and when, then you, you're not going to be a good football player, even if you can run like the wind. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And what I was meaning, like in, in terms of the learning curve. So for me, I'll, I'll use an example. When I was like, when I was a whitewater kayaker and I wanted to learn to cartwheel my, my kayak. Mm -hmm. Right. And there was a real, in my body, it was like, yes, no, yes, no, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd be coming up, be waiting and surfing the wave. And then I, what you have to do is you said, I have to edge your boat and you have to initiate it by edging and throwing the, the nose in as on an edge, right? Mm -hmm. So it means you actually have to throw yourself forward onto that wave and slice the wave. And I remember the feeling inside me and it would be which one is going to win just this time, right? Because if, if the no was winning, I'd hesitate and I wouldn't get it, right? And if the yes was winning, you can actually initiate it and do it. And it's the learning place here because a lot of time we'll learn on the edge, mm, that kind yeah. of edge. And it's, a, it's recognizing in your body that your body may be having those moments of yes, no, yes, no. And how can you make it more yes? Yeah. Because then it will learn. Then the body goes, oh, cartwheels, no problem. Boom. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the... Uh... The cognitive and the unconscious minds. Sure. We we know that uh, um, if I raise my hand up like that, I have no idea how I did that. We know it's I up think, there. We don't know all the bits and pieces of how it. Yeah, how it, I I yeah. cannot tell you how many nerve endings were involved and. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we I, don't I, need to know. We don't need to know. If it's better if we don't, we're so much more magical if we can just do that. Exactly. Uh, so I don't know how I did that. So I'll. All movement that we do well or that we've successfully learned is unconscious. Yeah, and we might need to be really consciously aware as we're learning it. And then yes. it's that whole learning 
curve, right? It's like you're first really consciously aware and then it becomes more automatic so that you're less thinking and more doing, you know how. Right, so, so we have to combine those two. To use the example of playing football, uh, if you come, the quarterback comes uh, up to center or in the shotgun, whatever he is, and he looks over the defense. Now, the reason he knows what the defense is doing is because he studied it all through the week when yeah. he had time and he studied it for years and, and he does everything he can do to learn what they're doing and what they're thinking yeah. and how that's going to work with all these complicated plays that he could possibly call and what he, and all that happens before the snap after the snap, <laughs> that's different. So and that's some, when, that's when the, the experience kicks in. Yeah. And then, then it's like, okay, now we do this. And it's like the decision gets made and the action happens because, yeah. because you've practiced. Yeah, yeah, and because you have that whole repertoire to draw from and your body goes, this is the right thing for this moment. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you take notes and everything in, in while you're watching film. Yeah. So that's all very cognitive. And, and, and you even use the cognitive mind to memorize and so on. Yeah. Uh, so and you have to, it, yeah. It's uh, the same it's, yeah, the same with learning to run smoother, you know, like yeah. it's, you might slow down. So in the filming grace work, we sometimes will slow stuff down a lot to notice what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. What is it I'm actually doing? How does my foot fall on this foot? How do I strike the ground with this foot? How do I strike the ground with this foot? Because my feet feel different and my body feels different when I land on one side or the other, right? So it's yeah. becoming familiar with that and figuring out how do I how can I smooth this out and make it better? And then how do I bring it up to the speed gradually? How do I bring it to the speed that I'd need in real life? So it's uh, the cognitive phase when you're actually moving, you know, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Say you're driving in snow. I'm very cognitive because I know the first thing I need to do is slow down. Yeah. That's very cognitive. Yeah. And I know also if I'm going to turn or stop, I need to slow down more. Yes. After that, it's just, you know, really, really keeping your eyes on the road. Yeah, and we're but, much uh, more aware, like, as soon as they have to pay attention, like, all the attention is here. We're very present. Yeah. And then it's, then it's a much more aware process. It's not in the background. It's very foreground. Yeah. It's almost like background and foreground. Yeah. You know? So it's and, a real integration of the cognitive and the unconscious. Yeah. 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 And if you don't pay attention to the unconscious stuff, if you don't, if something's not going well, like if people have plateaued or if you're, you're going downhill or if some, somehow, you know, when I run, I feel like I'm really slogging and this other person feels, looks like they're just prancing along like a gazelle looking totally happy, right? And it's mm -hmm. like, I have to pay attention to what I'm actually doing it's the Moshe thing. If you, if you know what you're doing, you can do what you want. Right. So first of all, you have to figure out what am I actually doing? And then I can start to change it and play with the smartness of the body in terms of how to change it. And it has to be a change that includes all of me so that I can build new patterns. Because if I don't build with all of my physiology sensing the new pattern, my body's going to have none of it. Yeah. It just do what it knows. Yeah. Unless it feels a new pattern come in and go, hey, that actually works pretty good. And I like the feel of that. I'm going to do more of that. Yeah. And then the physiology is on board. Yeah. Yeah. So the cognitive part, if, if you're talking about movement, is always the uncomfortable part. Yeah. It's, it's much more comfortable after you've kind of learned how to do it. And then you can always take that back to the drawing board if you want to, if you want to do more. Yeah. Learn more. But uh, yeah, so... That's always, uh, we talk about getting out of the comfort zone. That's always the uncomfortable part. Well, yeah, and I think the cognitive part, we, we also pride ourselves in being very clever, clever mm -hmm. thinkers, but we get ourselves in trouble a lot. Yeah, think, okay, here's the next point I wanted to get to. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, you know, sometimes our smart ideas work against our smart body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that is such an important part. Because not only is that the more uncomfortable part, but you can't stay in the cognitive phase if we're talking about movement. That's right. If you're talking about staying, uh, studying defenses, you could. Yeah. But if we're talking about movement, you can't stay in the cognitive part because here's what's going to happen. You realize you're not moving so well and you try to 
you try to micromanage your movement and you are going to cause other problems and you won't get where you're trying to go. So if you were trying to give somebody a night and that's why, you know, seven tips to run better <laughs> doesn't necessarily work. Um, it may make you worse. You may injure some other part of yourself. Well, yeah, but, it depends on how the person takes it in, right? It, what, it does. Do, what does their body do with that? Yeah. So the important part, if you're, if you're trying to help somebody or, or yourself learn something new, is to use uh, three words that I just used recently. One is sensing. Mm -hmm. And the other is uh, gently observing rather than trying to fix. You can, you can gently observe what you're doing while you're doing it. And, uh, and gently imagining. Yeah. And you can do that while you're doing it too. You don't have to just do it in a lesson. You can take that into real life. You make, you make your changes that way or you, or you, uh, yeah, you make your changes that way rather than just forcing yourself to do something different or, yeah, or change change your muscle tension or something like that. I think and that's what yeah. makes it real when you take it into life and you see how does this work. Yeah, you know exactly. Exactly. So you know, so in a lesson, maybe you learn something interesting. I know some. Oh, I love so what? So but, now what happens in life? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I know some high-level people who have just a little bit of experience with Feldenkrais, and they can't necessarily see how you could ever take that directly into something. Even maybe get an awareness and it helps you running, but how could you even directly take these principles right into the moment when something needs to change? I had one one client who was great. Uh, he was he was pretty funny. He loved golf. Golf yeah. was his thing. So yeah. we do whatever we did, he would translate that into something that could help his golf gamer do something, which was great. Yeah. And so then he'd tell me next time about how he'd figured out this would, you know, affect this, that. Or, and then he came in one day, he says, snow shoveling. He says, I could throw snow halfway across the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> I never used to be able to do that. And he'd, he'd, he'd figured out that the thing we used that also was his golf swing was suddenly now letting him just. That's right. Just alone. You yeah. know, that's the but, stuff that makes this come alive and makes it sort of sift through you and make us able to do everything in life. Yeah. Yeah. Boxers yeah. know, uh, they know, uh, they know how to use the hips in coordination with the shoulders for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, I saw a, a training video of a, of a quarterback. I can't remember which one it was now, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, he was, so he'd do a, he was doing a shuffle movement down the, down the field. He, he'd take a couple steps and, and he would throw his, uh, his hips and shoulders. He would do that turn. He wouldn't actually do this, but he would just, you know, so he was dead. So he'd come off the correct foot, right. with maximum power. And he yeah. would shuffle down the field doing that. And uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's kind of like, okay, then, then that, that, that it's, it's like a sequencing, like a slingshot, you know, that yeah. eventually would go to the hand or go to something else. Yeah. Same with tennis players. They don't get the power from the arm. It's from the snap of the hip and the, the whole body sort of, it's like a whip, you know, like the snap of a whip in there that gives you yeah. that, that throw. And that can help you with all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Uh, in life. Yeah. yeah. So if we could take the, all these, uh, page after page you see of seven running tips and get people to do them as an experiment, gently noticing, gently observing, and seeing what works for them, they might actually get something out of them <laughs> without yeah. harming themselves. Yeah, and, and the gently noticing, observing, the other thing that's really different about this, those, especially those words, is you get to pay attention to your own experience. Mm -hmm. So it's not about what somebody else sees or what they're saying should work for you. You're yeah. actually getting to notice what's going on for you and how does it feel in you. And that, that is such an important part of improvement yeah. and about talking to the body because in the body, you're asking yourself, how is this? Yeah. And there's not many other practices like Feldenkrais work is one of the few ways of finding new function that really uses that and says that's powerful. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that actually makes the difference between whether it works for you or not, whether that's those seven tips land for you or not. Right. Another, 
you know, another example of this is, you know, when people come from, uh, they have, they've been at physiotherapy to recover from an injury and they were given some exercises and the exercise doesn't feel good. And so yeah. I'll ask them, so show me the exercise. And they'll show me and, and you know, like one, one woman came and she's standing on one leg and she's supposed to lift the other leg out to the side to do something on the hip joint. And I said, how does it feel to balance on the one you're like, like you're balancing on? Awful, you know? And so her whole body is fixated on trying to balance on that leg. I said, well, I got a little bit of groundwork to do first. <laughs> yeah. I got to figure out how to make something feel good. And then you can layer on the other things and make that exercise work for that person. Yeah. And, but he, noticing in our own bodies, if our body is saying that doesn't feel good, then there's something else you need to do first to, to build a foundation that would let the thing you're trying to do be possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So every athlete is looking for an edge so you can uh, have a little bit more caffeine or you could pay attention to what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And make yeah. it easier. Yeah. Like and make it, make it more your own way. There's a lot of things where we get in our own way. You know, and, and Moshe Feldenkrais would talk about parasitic movement, uh, things that we do that just kind of block the, the ease and the flow of the movement or sort of little extra things we'll throw in there that get in our own way. And if we can find out what those things are and clear them out, yeah. then things become a lot easier. So and that, yeah, exactly. So instead of going for the caffeine, figure out how to make the mover smoother, movement smoother, cleaner, easier, less, less obstructed. And suddenly you can do stuff differently. So that brings us to another, another thing here is that, uh, well, okay, we talked about the cost. There's a terrible health cost to not pay attention to yourself. There is also a cost in culture if you do sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there is, a, so uh, we talked about a growth mindset. Well, a, a, and Feldenkrais talked about the self-image and he talked about the self-image being in the motor cortex and, and all of that and having to do with movement. You change your, so you change your movement, you change your self-image. Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of a cost if you don't want to do that. And people avoid that yeah. sometimes. They do. Yeah. This so, is why working with animals is easier than working with people. Yeah. So I'll give an example. You know, if I'm working, I work with horses a fair bit. Yeah. And um, I'll do something with them and they'll find easier movement. Right. And they kind of go, oh, yeah, this is nice. And they walk around a bit and it's like, hmm, I like this. Right. Yeah. I have not yet had a horse who stops and kind of goes, but I'm not that kind of horse. <laughs> yeah. I now you don't run into I'm that. Not that kind of horse. Right. No, that, no. Yeah. But people yeah. will do that because we have that layered thing on top. I can't, you know, one woman I worked with, her shoulders were kind of like this and we got them here and she's, in the world and looking around and going really interesting you know this is one lesson standing there but then you could kind of go oh, but i don't this isn't how i am in the world i'm you know and you could immediately see her go yeah. back here because this is what she knew and this is who she was in the world yeah so the self-image has a lot to say mm -hmm. about whether you can change or not there there is a realization about yourself that you can yeah. have from that from just lowering the shoulders yeah or and, just being uh, here rather than here, right? It's a very different way of being in the world. Yeah. So uh, the cost to a growth mindset, well, the, the pluses are, wow, you can do anything now because you can learn. Yeah. And I have seen people very, very restricted. And I know from my own background, my own family back background, that I was terribly uh, handicapped and restricted by not having that growth mindset because... Uh, my dad was like, uh, you know, you don't want to say anything because you don't want to get anything wrong type of thing. I mean, yeah. that's, that's him in, in very brief, but yeah, because he was also a wonderful person. But but uh, there's, that, there's a real constraint there. Right. And so you'd be very yeah. aware of that. Yeah. And you're working so, within that to stay safe. So yeah. so so to uh, the cost there of a growth mindset is a little uh, a blow to the ego. <laughs> you have to be willing to. <laughs> To be a little fle more flexible now, instead of hanging on to all the all the false protection that was actually limiting you, which well, brings this. Yeah, Go ahead. and it's checking out whether the new thing is safe, right? Because again, what you want to ask oh, yeah. yourself, you can and you can try things out in little tiny bits. 
right? So probably for the woman that went from here to here, this was too much at one time, right? Yeah. And, and so it could have been something where, you know, she could be here and then at night when she brushes her teeth, maybe she could be here and there, right? Or in little bits so that you get to try it on and you get to see whether you're okay. I mean, is the world still safe when I am like this? Can the world deal with me when I am like this? Can I deal with myself when I am like this? Yeah. And those are the questions. And can my family, you know, like, am I safe? That's the fundamental question. Yeah. And does it feel okay? And does it feel reasonable for me? Yeah. And that is, and that is absolutely wonderful that you said that and said it the way you did, because you cannot and should not change everything about yourself. You just want to refine, uh, refine your experience in life. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you want to do. Because and do little, little bits at a time so you can try it out. Yeah. And figure out, do I like this? Do I, is yeah. this what I want in my life? Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. And that also opens us up to uh, every, you know, uh, so many words are cliche, but meaning, but uh, powerful and, and needing to be explored in more depth. Yeah. Or with other words, but yeah. the word potential. Yeah. Uh, what's your potential? Well, it's not what you thought it was. It's what it is. It's not what, uh, what somebody told you it is or what you tried to do that you're not ready for. It's what it actually is. So getting in touch with yourself makes you much more able to realize what your actual potential today is. Yeah. And, and then you may find out, hey, I actually did what, what was my potential today. That's a nice feeling. Yeah, and, and, and just what felt right for me. You yeah. know, like what felt creative. And for me, it's, it's like, um, it's, oh, it's tapping into the creative potential. And again, the creative potential can happen when we're in that state of feeling all as well. When we're in that, that good stress state, that, that state that's within the, that feels the safe, that feels safe, right? Because yeah. then the body and the mind feels free to be able to create something a little different and see what it's like. And knowing that we can create for me is the most powerful thing because that means that we can change. We can create things that we care about, which is different than being told you have to create or become this or become that. Yeah. You know, and that's Even if you're telling yourself that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of allowing it to come from the inside and, and the, 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 the life force that comes from engaging and creating in something that's interesting, something that interests me. There's a real life force that that comes with that. And so it's almost like if the yeah. training or the learning or something can be where it feels like a creative yeah. activity rather yeah. than drudgery. Yeah. That's that emotional state, right? And if it can become a creative process versus I have to do this. No, it's very powerful, you're saying. Yeah. 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 It's very much who you are that finally gets out. <laughs> yeah. That finally gets out, and I can also um, draw you along into things. So, I mean, the fact that you have opened up to everything that you're opening up to in your life, this is you're in a very creative part of, of your life now after, you know, younger years that were not like that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and you came into this and, and you figured out you could do this, and it's engaging, and it's kind of like, it seems to be something that gives you joy and gives you life force. Right? It actually fires you up a bit in here and, and, and makes you interested to be in the world. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of people our age who have kind of lost interest in being in the world. Now, that brings us up to a really important point. Uh, the word you stress is uh, the definition of that is the healthy or the good stress. And uh, I have seen that myself too, where people have nothing to do anymore at all. <laughs> they're kind of done yeah and even i know an example of somebody who's even reasonably happy with that i haven't learned anything for 30 years and i didn't want to <laughs> yeah but you're a bill you're you're you decline and decline and decline and decline until finally you can't do anything yeah if, yeah so go ahead uh, that's a type of freeze yeah it's a numbing down it's just easier to be like that and yeah 
we probably learned, a lot of us have learned, it's just easier to put away the stuff of, you know, like our dreams, our feelings, our whatever. It's easier just to put it away. Life goes on easier if it's like that. Yeah. And I'm okay with that, right? And some people are, and they'll just keep doing that. Unless you come into a place where it's like, actually, I want more. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's, a, that's a choice point. And there's some people that go that way and other people don't. There's so much more. I feel like uh, I'm getting I old know. now. <laughs> I was young for, I was always the youngest person at work for, forever. And then I wasn't quite the youngest person at work. And then, and then all of a sudden I had a birthday and I was 70. And then the next day I was 71. <laughs> I know. How does that happen, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but each decade has been rewarding. Yeah. In its own way. So yeah, yeah there's never an end to, uh, your adventure. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we're young at heart. And it's sort of like, it, I, I think the Feldenkrais work is great for this too, because it's a very creative kind of process. It's always looking for what's of interest to you that you could do differently that could make your life more fun, more good, more, more what you want, right? So it is an, always an engagement in that. And those kinds of questions in life keep us curious and engaged and I think that is so important yeah. yeah so and it's always nice to uh to uh as you get older you find out some of your friends have moved away or or are not here anymore so it's always nice to make new friends too Violet yes <laughs> yeah thank you for inviting me this is this has been fun yes so do you have any final words uh we're talking about life here I know, eh? But, but uh, do you have any final words uh, that you would direct to people who are living or people who are athletes in the cultural sense of athletes, not in the, yeah. sense, the broadest sense? I think it, it really is like, find the things that engage your curiosity. Allow what you're doing to be something that's something that you're curious about because then it will stay interesting and then it stays alive. If it becomes something that you're just doing because you have to, or you're doing it and not paying attention to it, or it, it has nothing in it anymore, then really check, you know, is there something that's worth it for me? Do I want to keep doing this? Or can I change this so that it becomes something that has life force and has creativity and builds me up over time that feeds me rather than depletes me? Yeah. So Violet, this has been fantastic. Can you tell people how they could get in touch with you or sure. uh, or yep. work with you? Or yeah. I have a, a website. I haven't actually been busy on my website for a while, but I have a bunch of videos there, little videos, little blog videos I did about three years ago that might be of interest to some people that talk to some of the things we've talked about here. But my website is www.violetvanhees.com. Mm -hmm. So that's V-I-O-L-E-T-V-A-N. H E E S dot com. Mm -hmm. And my email, if anybody wants to just email me directly, is violet at violetvanhees.com. Okay, that's pretty easy. There. All right. <laughs> okay, this has been way too much fun.